feel like somebody should break the silence, and then I realize that's actually me. Right. So this is a session. Um, I've been wanting to do it for a really long time, and I didn't know exactly what exactly I needed to say or how I should say it, and uh, so I just kind of went for it, and I feel like there's a lot to cover, and uh, I actually am a little bit nervous today, not because of the public speaking part, but because this is a really vulnerable topic. Um, it's vulnerable to exist as a neurodivergent person, and uh, it's vulnerable to talk about it. Um, but I also feel really special, I feel really honored, because this is a community that is so powerfully amazing that I feel really safe to stand in front of you, recorded, <laughs> and talk about this topic. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you for being part of that amazing community. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I have ADHD. <laughs> I, I am a super passionate person. I'm passionate about so many different things. I'm passionate about having things to be passionate about. And if I don't have something to be passionate about, I get restless. <laughs> like, I, I need to learn something. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is, is called Radio Lab. Does anybody know this? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. They're all over the map, um, and, and they talk about all kinds of interesting things, like the episode where they talk about how you can um, strap a nine volt battery to your brain and it can impact the way that you learn and actually change your brain's ability to absorb information. Amazing. Also, if you do it, don't, don't, don't tell anybody that you learned about it from here. <laughs> I haven't done it. I'm tempted to. <laughs> um, I love I love taking apart electronics and and doing strapping them together and doing different things with them. Um, this is a photo of me with an EEG sensor strapped to my head that I hacked from a children's toy, um, and then I connected it to an RGB LED. So the EEG sensor uh, picks up your alpha, beta, gamma, deltas, high, highs, and lows. And from that, it'll elicit, um, using the, the API, it'll elicit the attention and meditation values. And from that, I use that data to control the color of the RGB LED. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that I do in my free time. And also, I don't get to talk about it very much, so thank you again. <laughs> I am nervous right now, not extremely nervous. <laughs> but um, my professional experience, I, I actually worked with kids. Um, for about a decade before I did a career change and moved into the Drupal world. Um, I didn't know that I was neurodivergent at the time, but I really liked working with, uh, with autistic kids primarily. I um, also traveled a bit. I taught in China for a couple years before coming back and working with kids more. So yeah, done, I've done a lot of public speaking in, in China and then in my early career. Um, but yeah, worked in agencies for quite a long time. I worked as a contractor, just solo, um, before my current job. So right now, I'm, a, I'm technically a scrum master, although it's kind of a hybrid scrum master, process improvement, project manager. Um, you have to be really organized to be a good project manager. I am not really organized, <laughs> so I try, um, but mostly I just, I just try to automate everything possible and um, I don't know how project managers do it. <laughs> um, a little content warning about this session. Um, I can only speak for myself. Um, I am only an expert in my own experiences, and so I, I'm really sorry if I use language today that makes you feel like I'm misrepresenting you or anybody you care about. Um, I might not get it right. I'm gonna try. Um, but I, I, I warmly invite you to reach out to me and let me know, um, either at the end, if, if I manage to leave time for questions, or, or reach out in a DM, or, or however feels comfortable, because I want to do better, and your feedback is, is really precious to me. So um, if I get something wrong, please tell me if you feel comfortable doing so. Um, I think I am only an expert in my own experience. And I want you to know that I see you all as experts in your own experiences, too. Neurodivergent. What does neurodivergent mean? Um, so 
we as human beings put labels on things. We love putting labels on things. Um, many of us actually hate having labels put on us. But we need those categories. Those categories are how we got here. That's how we survived. That's, it's part of our biological imperative, our need to be accepted, to connect with the people who are safe for us. It's how we, it's how we survived. It's how, you know, um, it's how we can tell okay and not okay. And so there, there's this really interesting study where they were, they were, um, they were examining rats. Um, and they had the smart rats and then they had these other rats that were the not so smart rats. And of course, they put the rats through all of these different tests and, and the smart rats did really, really well. And the not so smart rats, of course, they, they didn't perform quite as well. And here's the thing about this study is that the rats were actually all the same. The only difference was that the smart rats had a label on it that said smart. That's it. So yeah, my brain is different. I am neurodivergent. That's a label that I exist in this world with. So I've only had this label since 2021. Um, part of the reason that I decided the thing that really changed my mind and inspired me to do this session is I was actually co-working with a friend of mine who works for a, a growing global team um, and he, his company is very DE&I focused and one day he said, hey, there is going to be one of the leading industry professionals coming out to my company to put on the session remotely and do you want to hang out in the room so that you can hear what this person has to say about inclusivity, about neuroinclusivity in the workplace. And I was so excited, what an opportunity. And I just remember standing in the kitchen with my, my friend looking at me sympathetically because the language that this industry professional was using was so inaccurate and so absolute as if the way that she was speaking described every single neurodivergent person, but not me. And it felt really bad because I worked so hard to try and fit in and to be seen as just another human being. And the language that she was using was so othering. And no wonder so few of us feel comfortable talking about our diagnosis. I mean, it, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't even feel like a diagnosis. It's not a disability for me. I'm really proud of the way that my brain works. But that's not how a lot of industry professionals talk about it. And it doesn't feel great. <laughs> And so I really wanted to share this session today in part because I want to hold the microphone and I want to control a little piece of the narrative because it's my story, not hers. So what is actually different about a neurodivergent brain? Um, it's a really great article. I've linked it in, the, uh, in this, the resource slide deck, which I will share with everyone at the end. Um, but embraceautism.com is a fantastic resource. I love the way that they share information. And they explain it as certain brain regions show high interconnectivity in autistics and comparatively reduced connectivity in neurotypicals, while other brain regions show lower connectivity. So basically, we just took all the skill points and put it all in one side of the skill tree and then neglected some other areas, pretty much, I think. And then ADHD brains have low levels of a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. <laughs> Wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to get that one. Um, which is linked closely with dopamine. I talk about dopamine all the time. It's, it's actually, I, I think about dopamine in my work, in working with people, in doing process improvement, in how I can set my team up for success and how I can motivate the people around me because as it turns out, I have a relationship with dopamine that is just a little bit more dramatic <laughs> than a lot of other people. But we all need dopamine. We all use dopamine. We all have dopamine in our brains. Um, a little bit of this session is also about anxiety, which is not technically part of the neuro neurodiverse, neurodivergent 
umbrella, but um, it's a really, really common side effect. And it's a really common experience for people regardless of how their brains work. And so anxiety is part of it too. And I think it's really important to talk about just as much as everything else. This is a really great quote from a fantastic uh, psychologist who helps high performers go big without burning out. Um, she also has ADHD. And I love this um, in part because it's so long <laughs> and that resonates with me. I am uh, rather verbose at times. But I also wanna talk about how we see ADHD as a superpower where we talk about how ADHD is a superpower. And it does, it feels like a superpower. I can do so many things that, that other people tell me that I can't do and then that actually just motivates me more. I can do a lot of really great things, not in spite of my disability, but because of it. But the thing that we don't talk about a lot of the time when we, when we have this, oh, ADHD is a superpower. When you think about superheroes in comic books, they all, maybe not all, but a lot of them really struggle with interpersonal challenges. And that's true for me too. Um, I guess it's probably true for a lot of people, especially neurodiverse. Anyways, where do you keep your ketchup? Does anybody keep their ketchup in the pantry? <laughs> this is a really important question when it comes to talking about neuroinclusivity and the importance of diversity. And the reason for this is because, think about it, if you keep your ketchup in the refrigerator and everybody else keeps their ketchup in the refrigerator and you run out of ketchup, where are you going to look for something to replace that ketchup? In the refrigerator. If you don't keep your ketchup in the refrigerator, and there are a few people here who do not, it's, it's particularly common in uh, British people and African Americans from the South is what the article that I read said. Um, some people don't keep their ketchup in the refrigerator. And so when they run out of ketchup, where do they look for a ketchup replacement? Probably not in the refrigerator. And so this is a really interesting question when we're thinking about diversity because every, I'm about to use absolute language again, many tech companies value innovation. And if you have a whole bunch of people who all think in the same way, sitting at the table trying to innovate, it might not work as well. But here's the thing about the ketchup question where if you Google it, you can read all kinds of articles about it. They don't always talk about the importance not only of having people who keep their ketchup in different places. The thing that they don't talk about as much is that you have to also make sure that people feel safe talking about the fact that they don't keep their ketchup in the refrigerator. I love this quote. You think about this quote through the lens of the ketchup question. We talked about how an, an autistic brain has just a different map of interconnectivity. Every non-autistic brain is roughly like every non-autistic brain. But no autistic brain is like any other autistic brain. So what does it mean to be neurodivergent? I mean, I think I've said this, but I can't speak for everyone. We are all so different that it's really hard to say that's what neurodivergent looks like. We're all over the map, but I can tell you, I feel really, really poorly supported by the medical system. I had an ADHD specialist who told me that he couldn't help me because I am too chaotic. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I know. <laughs> I can tell you that it can be a struggle some days. Um, I can tell you that it's amazing other days. We are superheroes sometimes, um, but a lot of the other time we have to pay the price when it comes to social interactions, trying to mask, trying to fit in, trying to seem like we would be a good job candidate. What else does it mean to be neurodivergent? Has anybody seen Ghostbusters? Yeah, it's a good movie, right? Do you know who wrote Ghostbusters? Dan Aykroyd. Did you know that Dan Aykroyd is neurodivergent? Did you know that Will Smith, Billie Eilish, Courtney Love, Whoopi Goldberg, Steve Jobs, Michael J. Fox, Ryan Reynolds may also be neurodivergent? What does it mean to be neurodivergent? I want to talk about this thing that we do in tech where we have these people and they're fantastic technical brains and they know everything about Drupal and they're just wizards and then we promote them into people leadership positions and walk away. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just because you're a good technical leader doesn't mean that you're going to be automatically an amazing people leader and that's hard. But I do want to tell you that to be a good leader, you actually don't have to know all of the things about how to lead people. You actually, you, you just need to ask questions and you need to listen. This, this myth that if you don't have all the answers, then you are a weak leader. It's not true. Okay, so jumping into some of the guts of this session. Um, there's five strategies here. There's five sort of core concepts. And uh, I'm not here to tell you how to execute every single one of them perfectly because you just have to ask questions and figure it out for yourselves and your teams and what's gonna work for your particular situation. There is no magic answer when it comes to neuroinclusivity, when it comes to inclusivity at all. But I want you to take these things and think about them and think about how they're being done at your workplace and what's working and what isn't. Hiring and retention is a big one and I think a lot of us feel like it's sort of outside of our control you know it's like a thing that HR handles and then and then we just sort of take it from there once we have a candidate lined up but it's important and we do have some role in hiring and retention if you are a person who gets to meet a candidate so there's a really cool thing that I've been very, very lucky to experience, and I, I actually see many of the people who I've experienced this with in this room right now, so which is awesome. <laughs> but when you take a bunch of people who have strong empathy, they're uh, high emotional intelligent people, high EI, and you put them in the room and you have them talk about a candidate, um, they tend to encourage each other to empathize with that candidate and they naturally will brainstorm ways to help lift that candidate up and make sure that the things that seem like maybe they're not very good at are genuinely true and it's not just because they were a little bit nervous or um, maybe not very good at verbally communicating on the spot about their, their experiences or whatever else it is that you might want to write a candidate off about. Put a bunch of strong EI people in a room and have them have a conversation, they will naturally start talking about how we can do better. And then there's retention. <laughs> this, is, this is hard. I, as a person with ADHD, um, I think I interview really well. <laughs> but getting the job is just part of it. Once I'm actually at a company, there's a whole plethora of other things that come into play that make me want to be there or not want to be there. And there's something that 
I've learned um, at the company that I'm currently at. And I didn't realize how important this was for my ADHD brain, but now that I've experienced it, um, I feel the impact. And, and as a scrum master, I actually get to facilitate this with my entire team, which is really, really cool. And that is goals. My brain loves goals. I love objectives. I love doing the thing. I love ticking the box. It's dopamine. But we all need goals. And so there's this really cool thing that happens when, when you have a high level goal and you break it out, and then each team has their own sort of subsection of that goal, is that your entire team, all of a sudden, is really aligned and really motivated, and they're able to support each other in ways that feel really great. And when they don't have that alignment, and when those KPIs, those goals just come out of nowhere, sometimes the KPIs, the goals, are actually in conflict. And this happens in agencies a lot because your project managers want to make sure that an, a, as much as possible is getting billed to the client. And your developers might actually be told, oh, bill as much, time, as much of your time as possible to any project regardless, like figure it out, find a way to bill it to a, a project because the high up people, they wanna bring down the amount of overhead. So what happens is you have developers who are like, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna build this to this project. And then you have a project manager who's like, we can't charge the client for that. And all of a sudden you're in conflict and nobody wins and it feels terrible. But if you can make sure that your goals are things that people can truly align on then they're gonna be able to support each other. And not only does that feel great for my ADHD brain because we're working towards something, but it's gonna be beneficial for everybody. I wasn't sure how to talk about this one, but it's, it's important. Um, I think it's also gonna be a little bit sensitive. So, be authentic. There are a growing number of studies that show that having diverse thinkers, not just neurodivergent, but all manner of diversity, is good for business. But if you say that you want to hire a diverse team, and then you are not willing to show up and follow through to support that diversity, it's probably not gonna be that good for business. And so this is something that, I'm not really sure how to talk about it exactly, but I think it's really important to tell people what you're actually wanting to do. Because if you tell me that you want a diverse workplace, and then you hire me, and then it becomes a problem that I have ADHD, not my behavior, but my diagnosis, it's not gonna feel great. <laughs> I'm probably gonna leave. Probably not gonna be great for morale. And so, yeah, I don't know, it's Pride Month, this whole rainbow washing thing. Just, let's just be authentic. Uh, for this one, feedback. This is important because there are so many different opportunities where we have to give each other feedback, whether it's quarterly feedback or is it code review or is it just that somebody maybe wasn't supporting you in the way that you need them to support you in a meeting or on your team and you need to just be able to communicate to them what's happening for you and how that's working and what you need. But we don't talk about how to talk to each other. We don't talk to each other about how to ask for help. We don't talk to each other how, about how to explain to somebody that something's not working for them. Enter stress, stage left. It doesn't help. It just gets worse. And now you're under stress and you still don't have the skills or the support to sit down and talk to people on your team about why it's not working for you. Feedback is so important and there are so many different ways to talk about feedback and so many different um, formats and structures and contexts, but it's kind of been covered a lot by people who are way better at explaining it than I am. 
Uh, last year at Bad Camp, I had the pleasure of attending a, a session by uh, Corey Nesland, who is speaking actually also right now at the same time. I was going to give her a shout out um, and tell everybody to go to her session too, because she's amazing. Um, but we're speaking at the same time. But in my resource deck, I have linked to her session presentation about feedback from Bad Camp last year. And one of the things that she talks about is, is how you can have different formats of feedback, how you can actually elicit feedback on your own terms, how feedback can be a thing that you get to use for your own career growth and not just a thing that happens to you quarterly. And the other thing I want to say about feedback is that it can feel really bad. I see a lot of heads nodding. It can feel really bad for anybody. Feedback that isn't really actionable or is confusing or just doesn't work with the way that we like to receive feedback can be very frustrating. But for me, as a person with ADHD, and I'm very fortunate to know <laughs> what is happening for me now, and now that I understand what's happening, I feel more empowered and it doesn't affect me in the same way. But once upon a time, feedback was the primary trigger for rejection-sensitive dysphoria. Rejection-sensitive dysphoria, and this is hard to talk about a little bit because it feels not a dramatic person, but I got some frustrating feedback that wasn't very actionable ones, and I literally thought about packing up my laptop and my dog and just walking away from my whole life. Like, no more mortgage, no more car, like I just, I just wanted to leave. And it felt like that is a good solution because the, the experience that I was having was so big. I didn't know what to do with it and I didn't understand what was happening and nobody could see what was happening. Because on the outside I'm smiling and nodding and on the inside I'm on fire. And there's an amazing YouTuber named Jessica and uh, she has a YouTube channel called How to ADHD. She's an amazing team of researchers who research these things, fact check it, make sure that the content of her videos are, is really, really solid. She also talks to supportive industry professionals. I will link to her channel in the resource deck, but she has a, a, a video on YouTube that explains rejection-sensitive dysphoria. And she also provides a handful of tools for how to manage it. Her videos are a treasure trove of resources. And if you are somebody who is experiencing symptoms of ADHD, whether or not you have a diagnosis, or if you know somebody, I highly recommend checking out her YouTube series. One thing that I do want to say about feedback is that sandwiches are for eating, not for giving feedback. Um, you can use the sandwich model, but please, please make sure that the thing that you need to say to the other person isn't lost in the bread. Because as a person with ADHD, I am constantly trying to figure out, am I masking properly today? <laughs> How am I doing? I don't know, I need you to tell me. You're doing great, awesome, okay, I don't need to worry about this, I can go back to my work. But if you tell me, you're doing really, really great, but you talk too much, but also, we really love the things that you have to say, I'm not gonna understand. <laughs> I need you to just remind me, hey, when you're in meetings, make sure that you give other people opportunities to speak as well Thank you. Ah, okay, I know what to do with that. There are lots of lots of different formats for giving feedback as well. I highly recommend doing a bit of reading, talking to your teams about how they like to receive feedback. It's also a really great resource called The Culture Map. We talked about The Culture Map at my workplace where we talked about do you prefer very direct feedback or indirect feedback? Do you need a lot of context or not? turns out that my ADHD brain needs things that fit on the culture map scale in the same way that somebody who comes from a different culture might. Um, 
it just turns out it's just different reasons why I prefer certain type of feedback. I'll link to it <laughs> in the resource deck. I want you to sit with this one. When you're providing feedback, if you're in a leadership position, if you have an employee or a direct report, somebody who you're responsible for, who was hired because they're capable, because they're inspired, because they're good at their jobs, and they're not succeeding, think about what it is that they don't have. What is it that they need to succeed? Don't hold people accountable. Hold people capable. When you sit down to talk to that person, think about the labels, the impact that labels and our biases can have in the way that we communicate with people and tell yourself, this person is capable and it's my job to figure out what it is that they need to thrive. Hold people capable. This one's big. <laughs> I could do a whole series of sessions just about communication and all of the different ways in which we communicate. But I think what I would like to talk about is media richness. Many of us have experience or currently work in remote settings. And we don't have opportunities to talk to people face to face quite as much. And we probably also have somebody who's responsible for the budget going, no more meetings, fewer meetings, too many meetings, more work, less talking. But we're human beings and we need to talk. And if we are gonna innovate, we also need to connect. You can't just drop a bunch of people in a room who don't know each other and tell them to come up with some amazing ideas. They don't trust each other. They don't know each other. They're not gonna be vulnerable and share potentially not great ideas, right? So media richness is this concept that I love very much. It's the idea that more complex topics need more complex forms of media in order to be able to communicate them properly. This happens a lot in tech when you are in a remote setting where you are doing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth on a ticket or in Slack. And you don't have the full attention of the other person. And really, instead of spending hours going back and forth, you could just jump on a huddle and sort it in 10 minutes. But then you also might have the pressure of somebody high up going, no more meetings, no more meetings. <sighs> You need to let us choose. Nobody wants to sit in meetings all day. It's exhausting. Okay, maybe some people want to sit in meetings all day, but very few people who I have heard <laughs> vocalizing about their feelings about meetings have told me, oh gosh, I really just wish we had more meetings today. That'd be great. It's not common. So when we tell you, hey, I really need a one-to-one -one every week, or hey, I really need a huddle to talk about this ticket, it's probably not because we don't wanna do our work and we're just looking for an excuse. So media richness, think about this one, talk about this one with your teams. Are we using the right format to communicate these ideas? Are we having a meeting where we're talking about things that could be an email or a memo? Or are we trying to communicate really complex ideas through text? Innovation does not synthesize from KPIs and unicorn sweat. You need to let people be people. Teams that have an opportunity to bond and connect also handle stress better. And I don't know about you, but my job can get stressful sometimes. Hopefully it's not all the time, but it can get stressful and I've been very, very lucky to work with teams who I have a really, really great connection with, who we have had time, we, we made the time to build our team. And when things got stressful, we showed up for each other. But it can be really hard to do that and to find opportunities to show up for each other when you have somebody leaning over your shoulder going, no more meetings.
change management. This one's fun. I love this one. I work for a company that, uh, before I joined, there was no Scrum Master. Uh, it was a brand new role, and there were also a lot of org chart changes, and so when I joined, I realized there are a lot of things that I need to fix, a lot of things that I need to change, and if you know anything about, well, I mean, all humans struggle with change. If you know anything about autism, that change is really hard. But why? Why? Why does it have to be that hard? Is there a way that I can make it easier? Would it be better if I just ripped the Band-Aid off and tried to change everything all at once? Or would it be better if we worked through the changes together gradually? And so I thought about this a lot, and I, I did a lot of research, and I learned about change management, and it's fascinating. Um, and actually not that complicated at the end of the day. So if you have a team and, and you're struggling with change, I highly recommend do some research on change management, agile process improvement, how to iterate through things. These are really great resources and I have had so much fun. I mean, I also have an amazing team, so it's not just me. <laughs> I have fantastic people who make change management fun with me. But here's what I did. I chose people from each of the four scrum teams. And I didn't choose the people who are the most vocal for a reason. And I also made sure that there was no management in this group. And the reason for that is because I already know what management thinks. I talked to management just about every day. And this is a group of people where when something isn't good, they tell me. They let me know. I don't need those voices in my process improvement group. I need the voices who I don't have an opportunity to hear. And I need to make sure that I create a safe space for them to speak. And so part of change management is communicating those changes. If you know that something is coming makes it a lot easier. If you know that something is coming and you know that if you speak up, you will be heard, makes change a lot easier. It's not so bad anymore. All of a sudden, change is not this thing that happens to us where our workflows and our systems and our schedules get disrupted without any warning. And so part of the reason that I put together this change management group is that not only is their job to advise me on how their teams are doing and what their teams need, but they also facilitate communication back to their teams. I'm just one person, and I'm not always super detail-oriented. I need help. I need help remembering which teams need to be told what thing at what time. There's a lot of moving parts in my job. And so these are ambassadors of change for me, and they support me by communicating in both directions. We've changed a lot of things. We've introduced story points and sprint planning, and we've changed the, the, the way that we communicate about release workflows. Um, we've changed our workflows quite a bit, <laughs> and nobody's complained because we take the time to talk about it and make sure that everything is really intuitive, make sure that everybody knows what's happening. We test things out and I ask people, hey, are we gonna be able to do this? Is this sustainable? Is this disruptive? How can we improve? What can we do differently? I love this question. What can we do differently? Not necessarily better. We don't have to know if it's better or not until we try it, right? Let's try it, see what happens. Set yourself up for success. As a person with ADHD, I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I miss details. I know that I forget things. But I also know that if I have all of the information that I need to do a task in one place, it's going to be a lot easier for me to do that task. In the morning when I wake up, I have everything that I need to get through the morning in a basket. 
I have my coffee, I have my meds, I have everything in that basket. Coffee grinder, all I have to do is wake up, open the cupboard door, pull the basket down, and everything I need is right there. So I use the same concept in process improvement. All of the core meetings that I need to get through the week are on dashboards in JIRA. I don't know if there's a non-JIRA equivalent for the tools that you use, but as much as possible, if you can get all the information that you need to execute a task in one place, it's going to be easier to execute that task. And this is something that I learned as a sort of coping mechanism, understanding that as soon as I turn around or change browsers or go to a different room, I'm going to forget what I was doing. But as it turns out, what's easy for me is actually easy for everybody else. So I have a dashboard for my sprint planning meetings, and I have a different dashboard for the sprint planning meetings when I need to talk about things with management. And then I have another dashboard for each of the teams, and all of these dashboards mirror each other, but they're slightly different. They're slightly just tailored for each of those people and each of those purposes. And now all I have to do is show up to the meeting and open the dashboard, and everyone's like, wow, you're so organized. No one actually has said that to me, but... <laughs> I feel organized. If you need somebody to do something, set them up for success. Put all the information in one place. Make it easy for them. This is not, it, it's not a marathon. What was this? Somebody, one of my team members said this to me. It's not a marathon, it's a relay race. That's what he said. It's not a marathon, it's a relay race. We have to work together to succeed. I love this one. I love pushing back. If you've worked with me, <laughs> I, yeah, there's a few people nodding in this room. <laughs> if you've worked with me, you know that I will fearlessly push back. But when you think about it, the only other option is to push forward. So when I push back, I'm doing it because it's not realistic. It's not a realistic expectation for my team. It's not sustainable. The thing that you're asking for, it's not gonna be easy. And so this happens a lot where if I have stakeholders or people who are interested, there's somebody who needs something done at a certain time, and I turn around and I ask the team, hey, can you do this? And they're like, oh, no, I don't think so. I turn around and I say, okay, let's figure out what we can do and how we can make this sustainable. Let's figure out what is achievable because the only other option is for me to turn around to the team and go, we'll figure it out. <laughs> We're gonna have to meet this deadline. And then guess what happens to the code base? It's not great. Guess what happens to morale? It drops. Guess what happens to retention? <clears throat> think about where you're pushing and think about the pressures that you're applying and think, is there another way to accomplish this thing? Every once in a while we do need to rally and meet a deadline, but Try not to apply that pressure unless we really need to. The last thing I want to talk about is the culture at our companies, the culture at my company. If you Google it and you look for how to foster a culture of learning, you're gonna find a lot of articles that are written by C-level people with other C-level people as the audience. And I think that's a little bit strange because they're not in the room learning with us, so why are all of the articles out there about C-level people? We're the ones who are in there being a part of this culture. But it's interesting because I really firmly believe that we can drive culture change as individuals, it only takes one person to change the dynamic of a group. It takes one person to speak up and say, hey, let's be a little more patient with this person. It takes one person to message somebody and say, hey, that meeting was a bit crunchy. How are you feeling? Are you okay? one person to say, you seem a little, well, maybe don't say you seem overloaded. Uh, I know your workload is really heavy right now. 
can I help you? You can drive change. Just a couple, couple more slides here. Almost done. Let people define growth for themselves. There is a saying that you may have heard, finish what you start. Do you know that one? Has anybody ever said, finish what you start to you? I don't finish what I start. I have 12 project ideas a day. But the thing is that a lot of the time for me, I'm not actually intending to finish the project. I'm just curious about the guts of the project. Why did I strap a, an EEG sensor to my brain and, and start playing with LEDs? It wasn't because I had any specific goal. I just wanted to play with LEDs and this cool sensor thing that I just hacked out of a children's toy. And so I have a lot of what other people see as half-finished projects, and they look at me and they're like, oh, what a disaster. You never finish what you started. I'm like, are you kidding me? I am learning so much. And if I took the time to stop and see every single project all the way through, I probably wouldn't have have as much time to socialize or sleep or pet my dog. It's not about finishing what I start. It's about learning for me. That's what growth looks like for me. That's my story, it's my experience. And we do this in the workplace too. We, we have knowledge sharing sessions, knowledge sharing. We want you to share your knowledge. You're an, a subject matter expert. So jump on a call and put on a session and speak to people because it's good for you. But that's not necessarily what we want to do. We don't, we don't want to develop our public speaking skills. We want to read a book and pet a cat. And that has to be okay. So. Find other ways to support the people around you and let them define growth for themselves. Support them in their learning goals. Don't tell them what they need to do to get better. Ask. And the very, very last thing that I'm going to say today is to embrace imposter syndrome. I talk about imposter syndrome quite a bit in my work and in my life. And a lot of the time, when I am the one who speaks up and says, hey, I'm like super anxious right now, I've experienced multiple times where there is a sigh of relief around me, like, oh my god, me too. Whew, I'm so glad you said that. We all experience imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is your brain going, oh my god, this is, this is a lot. There's a lot of things around you that you don't know. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because if you already know everything that there is to know, what are you doing? You're not challenging yourself. You're not putting yourself in a position where you have more growth. So if you're not experiencing imposter syndrome, maybe that's a great thing. That's, I don't know what that feels like. So, <laughs> But if you, are uh, if you are experiencing imposter syndrome, maybe just look at it and see it and recognize that that means that you're growing, that means you're pushing yourself, that means that you have more to learn. And that's a good thing. Embrace it, own it, recognize it, but don't let it slow you down. That's it for me, thank you. It is a miracle that it is only 9.49. I thought I was going to talk way too long. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yes. So this slide deck here, oh, the slide deck. So every time I start talking about resources, like How to ADHD, the YouTuber, other people who I talk to get really excited because they're like, oh my god, there's this other resource. You should also do, look at, look at this, read this book. I made the slide deck with my resources editable. So if you have an amazing YouTuber or a fantastic book and you'd like to share, please feel free to DM me, Slack me. I'm all over the diversity inclusion channel in, in the Slack community group. Um, if you search at Faye Loren, it's I'm the only one. 
So you can find me online. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Slack. I'm, I'm, you'll find me, you'll find me. Um, and I'll send you the link to this slide deck to share. But the question was, what is the name of that YouTuber? And the answer is, how to ADHD. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. Oh, one more, one more, yeah. Yes, if, if, the, if the techs have done their jobs and supported this session, it is, it is recorded, absolutely. So, totally, yeah, fantastic, yeah, totally. Any other, any other questions? Okay, let's go get some more coffee. Thanks everyone.